half in the bag. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Half in the Bag. Oh I'm my God, you two will never believe what crazy thing just happened. No. Oh. Oh, okay. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Half in the Bag. I'm Jay. And I'm Mike. And this week we saw Ender's Game and Thor 2 2. They made 22 Thor movies? No, I meant two as in also. Like in addition to seeing Ender's Game, we saw oh, Thor 2. We saw Thor 2 T O O. Right. Oh. Oh. You still think he's the one? This boy has the empathy to think like a formic. To understand them, anticipate them. He's not ready. You're never ready. Ender's Game is based on the book by Orson Scott Card, who probably hates the director of this film almost as much as he hates the gays. The film is about little kids being trained and recruited into the military for some reason to prepare for a forthcoming battle with giant alien bugs. Our main character, Ender, is the chosen one who will lead our world to victory because science fiction trope. Mike, what did you think of Ender's Game? Well, Jay, I couldn't wait for this film to Ender. I'm the first. Well, the movie has some problems. Um, we were the only ones in the theater, by the way. Um, that I think is a problem as well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, hard one to hard one to nail down. There, there's it, it, again. I, I've probably said this before, but it felt like a mishmash of stuff. Even though it's based on a book. Yeah. Well, uh, well tell us about the book. Uh, well, the book came out in the early '80s, but there's yeah lots of similarities to things like uh, the Last Starfighter, Starship Troopers. Um, some like, stuff that came out after the book, but it's still the movie version, at least, has yeah. that feel. I kept thinking of uh, Star Trek 2009 when they promoted a 14-year-old boy to Admiral. Oh, yeah, that's one thing to point out, is that this movie feels like it takes place over the course of a week, and he just keeps getting promoted. Yeah. <laughs> the book, I guess, takes place over a couple of years. Uh, but the movie, it's just like, every day, he's a new rank. I'm sure there's a billion science fiction books out there about subject matter like this, and it had a lot of interesting science fiction um, ideas in in the the movie, like uh, the the recruitment of of young people. I mean, they say in the movie that the reason why they're using young people is not just for cannon fodder, but it's because their brains can do the calculations faster. It was all really vague in the and movie. Like, I'm well, assuming it's fleshed out more in the book. Yeah, but. like um, I guess I guess it's like sort of like how when you're younger you can pick up a language quicker like you can you can learn uh, foreign languages as a child much easier than as an adult so sure. i think it's a concept like that except for shooting things um because harrison ford and, and um gandhi with tattoos on his face uh they're all like he's gonna do this next he, this is a great idea like i was like if you guys know so much why aren't you doing it <laughs> but i guess the little kid can do things faster so that, that's the general concept, and then the whole, um, th you know, the idea of genocide and propaganda and all, the, all that kind of stuff, like conditioning, yeah. mental conditioning, and so yeah, a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, I, I think it's one of those things that definitely works better as a book, based on the, um, the lack of anything interesting happening throughout the entire middle of the movie. The best thing I can say about the movie is that it made me really want to read the book, because yes. I'm watching the movie, and I'm thinking like, you know, I bet that this is explained more thoroughly in the book. I bet this theme or this idea, because there's lots of interesting ideas in this movie, but mm -hmm. none of them are really given any room to breathe. It, it all felt very sort of like, like they went through the book and just sort of very literally adapted the actions that happen in it mm -hmm. without sort of taking time to explore why they're happening or yeah. what they mean or the the dramatic elements of them. Yeah. Everything about this movie fell flat to me. Yes. That's, that's what I was so bored with the movie, my brain started to think about what might be in the book. Yeah. Everyone kind of feels like a robot, except for Harrison Ford, who just looks like he wants to nap. And yeah. I could relate. How'd you like to lead your own army? 
A great responsibility rests upon each of you. When the enemy first invaded, we were not ready. Millions of innocent lives were lost. We threw everything we had at the invaders. And the alien attack nearly destroyed us. That, that was the, the, kind of the contradiction I had while watching this movie, is that there weren't like, it wasn't like Starship Troopers, right? Where it's like, there's a couple of big action set pieces throughout the movie, you know, that happen. It's all a build up to this big thing that's supposed to happen in the end, and the whole movie is training. Yeah. And at the same time, it felt like they weren't going into the training as much, where it's just like, you're now a commander of this squad and you're gonna do this crazy like, um, they didn't even explain the rules of that zero G game. No. I knew it had something to do with teams working together and getting into the other teams, like capture the flag almost. Yeah. And I was like, I think that's what what's uh, entailed in this, in this game, but no one's explaining this to me. From, but from at the same time, it's very slow moving. Yeah. I was like. From what I've been told, all of that stuff is, is much more elaborate in the book. And that's something too, where it's like everyone's like, oh, this Ender, he's very good with, you know, uh, he has tactics and, and, and figuring out these problems and situations, but everything he does is really like basic common sense stuff, at least in the movie. That or everyone else is a dummy. I guess that could be the theme of the movie, is that everyone in the future is dumb. He does some clever things. That The sequence when he takes over the the dragons, uh, he create, they create a new team for him and then he beats the um, the little guy with the Napoleon complex. He beats the tiny man. Uh, who's very short um, <laughs> for Napoleonic reasons. Um, yeah, like that part was fun and, and I was like interested. And that then, was the stuff in the movie I liked. That's about the only stuff in the movie I liked. Yeah, and then, you know, it has this, this kind of, I mean, I don't know how much we want to get into spoilers. I definitely don't want to spoil the ending of this. Did you see the end coming though? Oh, yeah. Did you expect it? Oh, okay. sure. The, the twist where that sure. was super obvious? Yeah, no, I, I completely knew that it was, oh, this is, this is what this is. Um, some cornball stuff, like all the friends showing up at the end <laughs> to help. We brought all your friends, especially Bean, the kid you met on the first day. Yeah. He's your tactical officer. And the, the, the four-year-old girl is the one who's going to fire the space cannons. Yeah, that's the contradiction for me, is that it has those sort of like kiddie movie things like that in it, but yeah. it's in such sharp contrast to how dark the actual idea of the movie is, yeah. that they're just like training these kids to be heartless killers, basically. Well, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the, whoever uh, the author was trying to make some sort of commentary on the military in general. Sure, which is, but the movie doesn't have any sort of bite to it or satire. It just, everything, it feels like a kiddie movie. Yeah, but I think that's the production of the film itself. Because oh, yeah, I that's got, what I, mean. I got a lot of the uh, kind of the Hunger Games vibe, like from some of the, the way the costumes and the sets looked and the whole, like what, what it's the what do we got that's like out there. And yeah. Some, someone s searched around and found this book. Oh, this is... Well, not just one book. There's a series of books. Oh, yeah. So this falls right in line with, ever since Harry Potter now, they're always to try, trying to find that yeah. franchise that already exists. You right, know? right. Oh, this will, we can make this a new movie. There's four other books, five other books. We can just keep making movies. Yeah. To me, it felt like everything was just sort of rushed to get through everything that's in the book. Like, especially early on, like, they just drop you right into it, where it's like... Uh, uh, there's a battle with bugs and kids in training and there's bullies and now he's getting recruited and it's just like bam, bam, bam. And they need, they need to have this elaborate system of recruitment and training to defeat an, a space alien that will be taken down when one plane is flown into its mothership, <laughs> a la Independence Day. Yeah, yeah. I you know. So, um, so yeah, Ben Kingsley flies a plane in, in, into an alien ship. And that's how they need it. If there's a chance that because of you, the Formics might leave us alone forever, then I have to ask you to come with me. Was it weird to you when they were showing the video to the kids of the initial alien attack where the guy did fly up into the plane and it was shot like a movie? No, I'll give that a pass. That's movie stuff mm. and that's acceptable because um, they've done that a lot, at, uh, you know. Specifically, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, uh, when they're having the trial for Captain Kirk and then they just put the movie of Star Trek III <laughs> up on the screen. <laughs> See, that always bothers like, me. It has like close-ups and all these shots. Yeah. And, it's like, uh, and, and then they, they show the exterior of the ship exploding. Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> who filmed this? Who filmed that? Was yeah. there a little space camera floating around? Like, and it's just, put the movie up there. Yeah. That's the least of the movie's problems, Jay. <laughs> um, a big problem, uh, and dare I say, ruined the movie is uh, Harrison Ford. Oh, grandpa? Thank Sleepy you, grandpa? grandpa? Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, Harrison Ford did not want to be there. What do you think the book Ender's Game, why is it still so relevant now as it has been? Well, because I think it, uh, um, you know, Harrison Ford from Star Wars and now, like, he had, he was, he was funny and smarmy and ener energetic and now he's like, he's just like sourpuss old man. Yeah. And his acting, it's, it's, it's just so bad. He, all he just, he just says lines. I, I don't think he needs money. I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think Harrison Ford that. is hard up for money. So why bother? You're not doing it for any sort of love of the craft at yeah. this point. Why, it's why? like Bruce Willis, the same thing. Yeah. Well, I do hope that there is going to be a third one. Um, it seems set up for there to be a third one. What do you reckon? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. And that must be frustrating for the director, too, of someone yeah. like directing Bruce Willis or directing Harrison Ford, where you're like, eh. Yeah. Be like you, you used to be. You were in Indiana Jones. Oh. And he just shows up, and he's just like, Ugh, let's get this over with. <laughs> and it, it, every time Harrison Ford was on screen, it just pulled me out of the movie. Mm -hmm. I'm like, everyone else was trying. Even Ben Kingsley tries, you know? He, yeah. He, at least, like, you can tell the caliber they're they give it their all, yeah. no matter what the role. And that's that's a sign of class. And I'm not saying Harrison Ford is, is a non-classy guy. I don't know him personally, but you're, you're, you're ruining the movie. Um, you know. So Mike, would you recommend Ender's Game? I have to go with a no on this one, Jay. Uh, some good concepts, some good sequences. Kept my interest 52% of the time. <laughs> uh, real, real long dry spells, bad performance by Harrison Ford that ruined the whole movie, and uh, an overall kind of quasi-heroic story of something happening. And That's the biggest problem. No, I would not recommend it either because it's just so vanilla and, and dull. Uh, not just bad performance by Harrison Ford, but I would say by most of the cast. They felt like robots. So that's a no. Nope. Maybe read the book. I'm curious to read the book now. I'm curious too, but I'll forget about this in two days. It's just much easier to watch television. I'll do everything I can to win this war. Our next film is called Thor, The Dark World and it's released by Marvel Studios. And it's also the second Thor film about Thor. After all this time, now you come to visit me, brother. Why? To mock. I need your help. In the film, Thor battles the alien from Prometheus, who returns with the black goo and is up to some wacky mischief. The alien elf wants to shoot his black goo through the nine realms as all of the holes converge in the sky above Stellan Skarsgård's house. Natalie Portman's stand-in is also in the film, and she sleeps the whole movie inside a time-traveling boat while pretending to have some sort of disease problem with her because black goo is in her eyes. <laughs> Thor 2 has some enjoyable moments, but with a plot that's so schizophrenic, you'll need to take some Thorazine to understand what's going on. What? So Jay, what did you think of Thor Dark World? By the way, they, they need to start putting n uh, numbers on the end of these titles because we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have a, 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 a Resident Evil problem after I a while. I know, they've been good with the Iron Man movies. Yeah. It's just Iron Man, one, two, three, got it. Yeah. Now we're only on the second Thor movie and already they're doing the, yeah. the, the subtitle thing. I'm, I'm confused which one came first, Thor or Thor The Dark World? 
I don't know. And now they're making uh, Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Exactly. You can't have a number anymore. I miss numbers. Make Just it put so a number simple. on it. Just it, put a yeah. number on it. This, look what happened to Resident Evil. You had 17 films, and who the fuck knows what order they go in. Which is really disappointing, because those movies are great, and I want to watch them in the correct order, yeah. as the, the filmmakers envisioned originally. You mean Paul Thomas Anderson? Yeah, Paul Thomas Anderson, when he made his, his Resident Evil... Uh, I'm trailing off. So, Jay, what did you think of Thor 2, The Dark World? Uh, I thought it was a goofy movie with a gobbledygook plot, and it gets sillier and sillier as it goes along. Is it self-aware silly, Jay? I'm not sure. It maybe, maybe is. Because I, I actually rewatched the first one in, in preparation for this one, because I hadn't seen it since it was in the theater. And uh, that's a movie that is played way too straight for what it is. And this movie feels a little looser, a little more self-aware, where it's like, you know what? Nobody cares about Thor, so let's just throw in all sorts of weird stuff. And there's a lot of variety to the visuals in this, to mm -hmm. the, there's lots of, uh, there's, you know, fantasy landscapes and spaceships and alien creatures and monsters mm -hmm. and Stellan Skarsgård in his underwear. Um, and, and so there's lots of neat visuals and things going on to kind of keep your attention because otherwise you'd spend the whole movie wondering what the hell is supposed to be happening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I actually really liked some of the, the costumes and the alien designs. And yeah. it, it felt very Lord of the Ringsy. Well, that's, that's something that stuck out to me because in rewatching the first one, I was reminded of how chintzy that whole movie looks. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's a case of they didn't want to spend a lot of money on the first Thor movie but it looks like, you know, the fantasy world, the Asgard world. Mm -hmm. uh, it just looks like one big cheap set, you know, and then some CG backgrounds. This one feels more like an actual sort of lived in yeah. environment. You know what the big disappointment is, is that Stellan Skarsgård never got to go to Arsgard. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great set design, great costumes, the, the opening battle, it, it very reminded me of Lord of the Rings, because mm -hmm. uh, when they tell the story of the, the original ring and how they chopped the hand off, and the, that whole battle, remember that? Yeah. In the first Lord of the Rings? I, I do remember um, that. It was sort of like that. It's like, in ancient times, the, the, the evil elves, and blah, 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 and then it's like, neat, neat. And then, yeah, there, there's so much visual fun in this movie. Um, the, the, the rainbow bridge, the lasers shooting down. And, and I, I, it actually followed something that I, I may have said during the first Thor movie, or at least wished for the next one, was that, um, you know, like, like if you're going to do a, another Thor movie, have it be a Thor plot where the, the Asgard city and aliens and something, where it doesn't really have much to do with Earth. And most of that you know, followed along that line. Like, yeah. I, after a while, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, oh, they haven't gone back to Earth at all. Maybe this is just going to be a Thor adventure in space with his people and yeah. his enemies out there. And that would be great. But they had to, you know, dredge Natalie Portman out of the, the, the dumpster and, <laughs> and put her in the film because, they, you know, they need that connection. And then that, that girl from... Two ugly girls or... Two, two girls, one cup is what she's saying. Oh, yeah. Um, she, yeah, she was in the first movie. But she was a nobody. Then she was, I, yeah. I don't know if they decided to beef up her role in this movie because she's on a popular sitcom now, but she possibly. got very grating. Yeah, yeah. She, she, her, and Fran Drescher should try to kill each other with their voices. <laughs> there was darkness, and it has survived. What's gonna happen? I gave you my word. I would return for you. I guess let's, uh, I don't even know if we should bother talking about the plot. The, the plot is lots of things happen and you sort of wonder why they're happening. Yeah. There's like Nat Natalie Portman is now in Paris. They're doing investigations or whatever with her research in London. team. London. And uh, they find this old factory and she accidentally goes through a portal to another world. And then there's the magic flying Kool-Aid mm -hmm. fruit punch mm -hmm. that goes into her body for some reason. And then somehow she ends up back on Earth, and then Thor shows up, mm. and the people, the alien creatures, the Prometheus monsters that want the, the fruit punch, mm -hmm. they, they try to get it out of her body. Yeah. 
And that's what happens in the movie for some reason? Yeah, because the, the Prometheus alien wants to take the, the black goo and, <laughs> and, and shoot it through all the converging planets. When, whenever you need a sci-fi plot, like a whipped up, this, this big event's going to happen in your sci-fi film, you just go some kind of alignment of planets. Yeah. And then magical things happen. And it always has to result in, in multiple universes being destroyed. Yeah. Or Although something I, shooting up into the sky. Yeah, which is just like uh, uh, the Avengers movie. Except did. for this time, they didn't go with the blue laser shooting up into the sky. They went with goofy smoke or mist or, or slime or something. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, it's just like... It's just a bunch of silly shit. I guess if comic book fans out there know about these plot lines, maybe they exist in the comic book world where the nine universes and the ancient elves want to want to shoot black goo through a bunch of holes <laughs> in the sky if, if that's a thing that's a thing whatever but I, it, it really the definition of this movie is weird stuff happens yeah yeah which you know what is is appreciated from sure. a thor movie because yeah. the one thing i'll say is that this is not as forgettable as the first one no when no. i rewatched the first one i realized that i forgot almost everything that happened in that movie yeah except for the the rainbow bridge the magical rainbow bridge the and, Bifrost. and and a giant robot monster attacking a yeah. new mexico city that's like all i remembered yeah you gotta have a big thing like Thor hits a rock monster in the beginning, yeah. and then there's a, 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 an elf. He eats a rock, or the, the Prometheus alien puts a burning hot coal inside his belly. Oh, yeah. And then he's like, just keep this in here. He's like, couldn't you and put then... it in my pocket? <laughs> Did you have to put it in my belly? And so he sneaks it into Asgard, and then when he takes the hot coal out and squeezes it, he turns into a stronger creature that smashes everybody. And then uh, uh, I guess, oh, he, his job there was to, to knock out the glowing orange ball that put a, a shield around <laughs> the Emerald City so that, <laughs> so that all the, the elf ships could fly in and yeah. one could crash into it. I, also, everyone could get Natalie Portman. Yeah. Uh, so that someone could get the goo out of Natalie Portman. No, it's Thor's job to put the goo in Natalie Portman. Oh, oh. No one really knows what's happening in the film, not even <laughs> Thor. Thor. Thor's like, he's like, at the end of the film, he's just, let, let me just boil everything down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trick the bad guy to go to this empty field, and I'm just going to go and hit him with my hammer, because I don't understand what the fuck is happening. <laughs> so I'm going to just, I'm just going to steal a little time-traveling floating ship and go to this other planet and punch this guy. Because mm. that's kind of Thor's thinking. Yeah. He doesn't understand the science behind it all. Natalie Portman does for some reason. Because she's a scientist. She's a scientist. Natalie sure Portman is. is a scientist. Hey, she makes a more convincing scientist than uh, Denise Richards. You face an enemy, known only to a few. Known only to one. You must be truly desperate to come to me for help. Were you getting any uh, Star Wars prequel flashbacks in this movie? Oh. I did multiple times, which I was not expecting from a Thor film. Not really. Um, I, do you just mean the fantastical environments that everyone's in? The, the visuals of Asgard, there's a part when, when Thor and Natalie Portman are like right on the lakefront and they're touching hands. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking back to the uh, I don't like Sam stuff for yeah. episode two. And, not really. I think the, the technology has advanced so much where, like, uh, when the, some of the parts, I'll, I'll admit, like, reminded me of the Star Wars prequels, like the Asgardian capital building with all the pillars. Yeah, that's what, I, like, the look of that yeah. city reminded me of, uh, what is it, Coruscant? Coruscant? Cor Cor Coruscant? Coruscant? Thor 2 was, was a bit schlocky. Um, it becomes bogged down in the stupid plot for a while, but then it starts taking itself lighter, yeah. like almost towards the end. Once they get back to Earth, that's when it was, yeah. it just was like, whatever. But Thor, Thor is like, he's great for uh, fish out of water humor. Um, like there's a part where he comes into somebody's apartment, you know, oh, yeah. when you take Thor, he's like this God character and you put him in real world situations, it's instant comedy. He hangs his, his um, hammer up on a, a coat rack. You have, to, you have to have some levity in a movie that's about black goo shooting through holes in outer space. Yeah. Like towards the end of the movie there, Stellan Skarsgård invented a bunch of rods with mm. something on them that 
disrupt or create temporal vortexes or something, and they're like, put them all around in the, somewhere in the temporal <laughs> vortexes. Blah, blah. And then Natalie Portman clearly says, she goes, when all this stuff goes down, it, physics is just going to go out the window, which means there's going to be a great fun action sequence. <laughs> that things. makes no sense. And it was fun. Like cars yeah. are flying into different dimensions and Thor's flying and buildings are falling down. And it wasn't excessive over the top explosions and violence. It was more clever. Mm -hmm. and well, more it was more fun. visually exciting than just yeah. buildings toppling yeah. over. Or We've seen that somewhere. so many times. Yeah. yeah. It, it gets, it gets uh, comical and weird. Yeah. Why do you think this movie chose to devote so much time to Stellan Skarsgård with no pants on? The, do you think because these Marvel movies all tie together? You know, they're always like setting up characters in one movie that show up in another. Do you think that somehow uh, Stellan Skarsgård's character ties in with uh, Lars von Trier's next movie, Nymphomaniac? Oh. Thor, your bravery will not ease your pain. Your family, your world will be extinguished. The, the one thing I'll give it is that it, the relationship and the dynamic between Thor and Loki mm -hmm. uh, has been really strong in all yeah. these Marvel movies. And that's like, it's kind of nice because that's one sort of emotional connection you have with this movie is, is those two and their right. dynamic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it pays off well in this movie, I thought. Yeah, yeah, that's a good element. I wish the... Uh, I wish someone other than Natalie Portman was in this, but I wish that element, um, Thor's romance with a human woman, like... Yeah, they have no chemistry. She's just like cornball, unrealistic, brilliant scientist with the theories. And like, and then of course, like, it's her who gets caught up in this, this interdimensional plot. Yeah. Just c completely rammed in there, like... Yeah. And, and, and then they don't seem to have any charisma or chemistry, and it's just like, meh. I'll find a way to save us all. So, Mike, would you recommend Thor The Dark World? I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I, I liked <laughs> it. I liked it. Obviously not for the coherent story right um but there there like you said there's some good character dynamics um it's it's a good marvel movie it's not the top it's not the bottom it's right in there and it's it's um really got some really nice special effects really nice uh, i like the look of those those elf aliens yeah. especially when he turns evil like he's a good looking uh, evil character yeah. and that was fun um i think the uh, overall uh, creativity and visual variety and weird things happening makes up for the dumbness. Yeah, I would agree. It's it's the best approach to take to a Thor solo movie because mm -hmm. he's like a second tier Marvel character yeah. and he's not charismatic and he's not interesting. He's like Marvel's version of Superman where it's mm -hmm. like he can do anything so who cares? Yeah. Right. So they try and fill up the time with, with interesting side characters and, and visuals. Which and that's is, the best way yeah. to approach it. Yeah, and there was some even though I didn't care about Black Goo turning galaxies into mush, there was some, some heroic moments mm -hmm. when you're rooting for Thor, and that's all you can ask for. So what was the deal with that teaser during the credits of Thor 2? It was like Benicio Del Toro with white hair. Oh, yeah. I think he's the collector. I don't something. know who that is. I don't know who any of these characters are. They're really digging at the bottom of the barrel for villains now. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Because you two ignored me, I couldn't get help in time, and my grandson choked to death. <laughs>